Well, welcome back to the last of our short lectures on topic six, fracture and fatigue. And today we'll be looking at how things break when we look at them up close with microscopes. And we call this, what, this concept of how things break fracture mechanisms. And we generally categorize fracture mechanisms into two groups, brittle fractures that happen suddenly and ductile fractures that happen slowly over a period of plastic deformation. So let's take a look at how we can visualize the difference between ductile and brittle fractures. So imagine that we pull on a tensile bar, or a flat tensile bar, something that looks like this in cross-section, a cylinder. If we pull on it and it necks down to a point, we consider that to be very brittle behavior, highly, duct or, excuse me, highly ductile behavior. On the other hand, if it necks down some but then has a jagged, tortuous appearance in the center, we call that moderately ductile. And if it doesn't neck down at all and just snaps in half, we call that brittle behavior. So you can imagine this would be like a piece of chalk. If I pull on the piece of chalk hard enough, it'll break without necking down. If I took silly putty and pull on it, it'll neck down to almost a perfect point as the last of the silly putty is pulled apart. And in between is the reality of what most materials look like some combination of both ductility and also brittle behavior in the center of the part. So let's take a look at a typical ductile fracture. This is a ductile fracture from a sample of steel and it forms what is called the classic cup and cone fracture. So here we have the cup. Let's see, here is the cup. Let me put on a pen. So here's the the outer diameter of the cup, almost. And here you can see the base of the cup. And here's the cone. You can see the cone going up from the outer edge, up towards the top. This cup or cone region here is where we exhibit necking. And then the center part of the cone is where we see the brittle final fracture. Usually the surface is dull gray because it exhibits a lot of plastic deformation, so very little light is reflected back at us. The fracture surface is what we call fibrous, meaning it's very bumpy rather than being flat. And there's usually a lot of necking. That's the giveaway. Now what does it look like up close? Well, in ductile fractures, the, the clear sign of a ductile fracture is the microvoid. So here we are at a magnification that gives us this dimension of 50 microns. So that's about half of a human hair. So these are very small features on the surface of our fractured sample. And we see little voids that popped open inside the material. In addition, there are oftentimes chunks of material that are precipitates that exist at the bottom of that void. Brittle fractures, on the other hand, tend to be very, very flat and exhibit very little necking. They're usually bright because they reflect light back at us. As you said, there's little necking. And the surface is flat and generally perpendicular to the loading axis. <coughs> Although sometimes it can be uh, at a 45 degree angle to the loading axis. There are two modes of brittle failure in materials. One is called transgranular cleavage, which we see exhibited here, where the crack propagates across the grains or through the grain grains, and we see the planes of atoms lined up along that path. The other possibility is intergranular decohesion, and here the crack travels along grain boundaries. Here are some pictures from other types of fractures. This is a liquid crystal display fracture. You can see the long polymer chains are lined up in the direction, all in one direction, which is what makes liquid crystals behave the way they do. Here's carbon fiber composite fracture, where we can see the individual fibers from the carbon fiber sticking out. A Kevlar composite fracture, where the fracture has occurred along the length of the fibers, as opposed to across the fibers. And here's a polystyrene fracture, where you can see the flat sheets of polystyrene crystal that once existed inside this material. 
fatigue, which we talked about in the last lecture, also has a, exhibits a telltale fracture surface. Fatigue cracks usually initiate at the surface, so we'll often see a small spot that's shiny and flat and looks different in appearance from the rest of the material. This is the initiation site, which I'll highlight right there. The crack propagates forward at a stable but increasingly fast rate. So these marks here that show that these lines are fatigue crack propagation lines. And the crack is gradually growing outward in these directions. Until eventually we reach an area where the crack is no longer stable, it's hit its critical crack size, and fracture occurs rapidly or is catastrophic across the remainder of the surface. And here we see that the surface is very tortuous and bumpy. So let's go back to our concept of the pressure vessel. So here's an example of a steam pipe explosion. This happened after 9-11, and you can imagine that it terrified the people of New York to think that there is another explosion in the city. So again, we have a pressure vessel. We're going to assume it's a cylinder. We'll look at the cross-section. It has a radius R and a pressure inside of P. And let's take a look at the thickness of the sample right in one small area. So we blow that up, and what we see is that it has the wall has a thickness T, but it contains a crack of size A. Now the stress, or hoop stress, acting on this, th this wall is equal to the pressure times the radius divided by T, the thickness. Well, there's two ways we could design for this situation, because we want to make sure that the pressure vessel is able to withstand the pressure P without hitting the critical stress C or the critical crack size A, A sub C. So yield before break is one possible design approach. And yield before break says that we want the stress to be equal to the yield stress, but that the, the stress always remains less than the critical stress for fracture. In other words, sigma, in this case, sigma can be greater than sigma y the yield strength but sigma must be less than sigma c for that crack to propagate and we could calculate sigma c based on the fracture mechanics equations discussed earlier another way to do it well let, let me back up the advantage of doing it this way is that the in a yield before break condition, we will see a bulge on the outer wall of the pressure vessel because of the plastic deformation before the crack propagates all the way through the sidewall. So this gives us some evidence, some indication that something is wrong and that we should depressurize the vessel. Another approach is called leak before break. In leak before break, we want the crack to be able to grow until it reaches the thickness. In other words, we're going to allow the crack to grow all the way through the wall to the other side, but that the crack never gets to the critical crack size for fracture, A sub C. So in this design scenario, what we're doing is we're allowing the crack to grow through and pressure to escape out through the side wall. So if this is steam, we'll see the steam coming out of the pressure vessel before it ruptures, again giving us warning that something is bad is about to happen. So in yield before break design, the critical crack stress must be greater than the yield strength of the material. And so we can plug in the fracture toughness of the, <coughs> the fracture toughness of the material, the geometry correction factor, and of course the crack size that we believe exists in the material. This crack size can be can come from either actually examining the materials and, and finding cracks and, and estimating their size or by simply assuming a particular design crack size from manufacturing uh, testing. The other approach is the leak before break where the critical crack size is equal to 1 over pi times kc over y sigma squared and that has to be greater than or equal to one half of the thickness of the, the, the wall. So let's take a look at some materials that are often used for pressure vessels.
things like high carbon steel, stainless steel, wrought aluminum alloys, low alloy steel, and medium carbon steel. What we see is that the steels have high strength and also very high fracture toughness, whereas aluminum has a much lower fracture toughness and strength compared to the steels. We could imagine that there's a minimum acceptable yield strength for our material, for our pressure vessel, of about 300 megapascals. We could also imagine there's a minimum acceptable fracture toughness of about 10 megapascals square root meters. This is typical of engineering design that a value of about 10 is the lowest you're willing to go. All of our materials pass these two conditions. If I then apply what's called the fail-safe design approach, which puts a line relating toughness to yield strength from our yield before break criteria, I get this area in the upper corner where I'd want to design optimally. So there is a small possibility of using aluminum, but you'd have to make sure you have exactly the right aluminum and it's processed in exactly the right conditions to get the correct performance. Whereas stainless steels, high carbon steels, and low alloy steels all have large areas within the optimal design space. Again, we're looking for high toughness, 